All right, so I've uh, cleaned out that little bit of um, extraneous data from scan number six, and I've turned everything back on for this next process. Now, when we go to align these these uh, scans, all we have to do is get them close. And there's a number of different ways that we could get them close. I could come over here to the editor tool, which editor has a position and a transform tool that lets us grab these scans and actually move them around, translate them in space. But the better way is under this alignment panel. Now, you notice that it only, as soon as I clicked on the align button, I see all of the scans in this list, but only one of them is selected and only one of them is visible. That's because this is the benchmark against which we will align all the other scans. Still, we've got, I mean, we have a coordinate system in there, so I could see positive x, y, and z axes, but there's no relationship between the coordinate system and the data. So we're going to establish a relationship between scan number four, which is the scan at the top, and all the other scans. Sometimes I'll, we will reorder these scans because it, it's very helpful to have overlapping pieces of data. If scan number one, which I've just made visible here, has bits that are also in scan number four, it'll be very easy to align these up. But if I'm trying to align the... Um, a bit of an object that's completely separate from uh, the previous scan that's visible, then I'll have a really hard time aligning those two. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm holding down the shift key. So you see I've got two pieces of point cloud data on there. The blue one is the scan number four. It's locked in place. Scan number one is the green one. It's the one that I can manipulate. If I don't hold down the shift key, I turn the whole view. So left click rotates the view right click zooms in and out and middle click translates the view now if I hold down the shift key those controls stay the same but now instead of changing the view I'm changing my free-floating model as it were the the scan that is established there scan number four stays in place all I'm really doing is I'm looking at it from different angles and trying to get it lined up kinda close so say put the eye where the eye should be on the first one, tilt it down a little bit so that they're lined up, move them both in place. And once I get them kind of close, which I think that qualifies as kind of close, I'm going to hit the Align Meshes button, and the computer is going to go through, and it's going to look at all the data in scan number one, compare it to all the data in scan number four. And if it can find enough coincident points between the two scans, it's going to align them together. And now it looks like I have one scan here that is actually made up of scan one and scan four. It's both the scans perfectly aligned. Sometimes, and one of the good things about skulls is they have enough variation in the uh, geometry and the, um, the texture. Sometimes I can just hit this I'm feeling lucky button and it will uh, just align the meshes for me automatically. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So we can come down here and let's say I'll take the next one. I'm feeling lucky. Let's see where it pops in. All right, so that one worked too. I could conceivably go down this whole list just hitting I'm feeling lucky. And I bet it would work, especially since the more information that gets aligned together, the the more that it has to work with on each subsequent scan to do the alignment. Another technique, so that's two different things that we've looked at. You can sort of manipulate the scan until it gets close and then hit the align meshes button. Or I could put down markers. So if I see a point, let's say this, this little hole right here, put down point one, I recognize it as being that thing right there. Uh, but see, that didn't work out quite right. So I can grab this point and move it to where it needs to go. So I saw that little divot on this scan. I saw the same little divot on that other scan. And let's see if I can pick a couple more. There's that little feature. Oh, I forgot to create a new pair. Hit the new pair button. Now I now those that pair is locked in place. Oh, that looks like it's in slightly the wrong spot. You can see this is a little bit more of an involved process and in some models this may be the best way to do it. If the computer can't figure out 
for itself how the meshes are supposed to go together you can always give it these little hints and three or four pairs are typically all it needs Another one right there. Oh, I don't have anything on. I have to do everything on this side. I'll go with the tip of the nose there. Okay, so I've got three pairs of points down. And I can hit this align markers tab and it'll move them to where they're to where they're lined up. And then hit the align meshes button and it'll do the rest. It, that wasn't really necessary for something like this because I could just hit the I'm feeling lucky button. It seems to be working well for me so far. But for some scans, um, particularly if the subject that you're trying to scan is um, like a solid color and a smooth finish, you may actually have to put little markers on it or markers around it. Um, if you remember from the video where we're actually watching the scan, the platform that I have it has a bunch of little random X's and O's on it. That's what that's for, is so that if I need to, I can pick a point on the table in multiple different scans and use those points as markers to align my meshes if it's a subject that the computer has a hard time figuring out. The skulls kit typically don't take too long to um, align like this. Although this one's taking its own sweet time, so I'm thinking it may actually fail on me. Yep. Okay, so that's no big deal. I'm feeling lucky, wasn't quite so lucky. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of help by at least pointing them in the same what are you thinking? direction. And now I'm going to hit align meshes. And by virtue of them sort of being pointed in the same direction and different features being closer together in space, then, uh, then it's probably going to work out a little better. Yeah. So our skull is actually starting to look quite skull-like. I can look at these little regions right here and see that, okay, so these are areas that I still need to get data. Hopefully some of these other scans will have that data in it. Oh, this looks like this is going to fill in nicely right there. This one's going to be ticky because it's such a small scan. Bigger scans are typically easier to align sometimes, or at least it's been my experience. Oh, it looks like this one has an extraneous bit of tray material left on there. So I think that's my snap end. There we go. That looks like that had that's how that goes. We shouldn't need to fill in the gap at the bottom either, should we? Why? Or we would need to do the solid. Just a couple more scans left to go.
and the skull seems to be coming together kind of nicely. I mean, it still looks like, you know, a spiky mess, but we'll, we'll smooth all of that out when we actually generate the mesh. We're still working with just point clouds here. Sometimes it's a good idea to move the the data that I'm trying to manipulate away from the aligned meshes just so I can see what's going on with it. But one thing you have to remember, everything rotates around the origin by default. So if it's close to the origin of the coordinate system, then it'll rotate around itself. But if it's off to the side, it'll sort of uh, orbit the coordinate system. So that's something to be aware of. Sometimes it gets difficult to figure out exactly what piece of the skull I'm looking at. All right, we're back again, and I have all of the scans aligned. And you can see it looks an awful lot like a deer skull now, and not a exploded deer skull. So now we're in the process of taking the uh, taking this point cloud data, cleaning it up just a little bit more, and um, generating a mesh out of it. Now we can look and see, like if we look down here at the end of the nose, you can see how the scans are kind of all aligned in the same way, but I've got bits of different meshes that don't line up. The next process is going to take the registration, the um, the alignment of this data, even further and make this sort of a uniform surface. So all of that is under this tools menu here. I don't think I need to do any uh, rough serial registration because it looks like all the data is more or less where it needs to be. So the first thing I'm going to do is a global registration and this could actually take a while for something this big. It's, uh, it goes through these different steps and depending on the size of the, uh, of the mesh this could take, uh, I've seen this take upwards of an hour to do. <laughs> so I'm going to pause the video for a minute and uh, when this is done I'll be right back. Okay, we're back again. We've done the global registration and we can see that that took 1,300 72 and a half seconds in order for it to globally register. But one of the things that we noticed, you remember before how it looked like there was a bunch of different layers for right here at the end of the nose, and they're all together now. Uh, but one, one thing that has now reared its ugly head that we have to fix, look at all these scans over here. All the numbers have changed after it's gone through and globally registered all the data. Uh, some of these numbers are down near 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but several of these data sets have a warning sign on them. Uh, that means that there's bad data inside of those scans that is either going to be ignored or not used, but it is definitely taking up space. So we can clean up a little space and clean up our scans a little bit by going into each one of these and sorting them by quality. So if I sort it by quality, I see that there's one frame of data, and there it is right there. There's one frame of data that the software failed to globally registrate. So I'm going to just delete that one frame of data. Got this one, there's one frame of data in this one. Well, it's really good. Usually it's dozens and dozens of frames. Uh, so this one had several frames of failed data. Just select all those frames and delete them. And you can see the quality of my scans is going up as I excise this bad material. And out of 20 something gigabytes of data, I think I can afford to just discard some of it. So now, now my scans look a lot cleaner. All of my quality ratings are, there's a high one there at 0 0.3. Uh, if I wanted to, I could probably take this out. The quality means the same thing inside the scan as it does outside the scan. It's a confidence, it's a confidence reading. Uh, if I get rid of things that are too high, then it's going to improve the overall confidence of the scan. The end result will be cleaner. 
So we have globally registered our scans. We have removed all the bad data from the scans. Now the next thing to do is to remove the outliers. And what it's going to do is it's going to do a statistical analysis on this surface and find things that don't belong, that fall outside of a uh, predefined mean deviation. Uh, I should mention that all of these different procedures have settings under them. If you click on this little down arrow, it will expand a window and you have some more settings. So you can, um, you can fine tune the way some of it does. And when we generate the mesh from these, we'll be making use of that. For the most part, for the registration part, um, the defaults that come with the software usually do a pretty good job of doing it. We're almost done with the outlier removal. As soon as this little green bar gets over here, this is always the exciting part. Take just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Fortunately, I can amuse myself by moving the model around while it's thinking. That doesn't seem to interrupt the processing. And it gives you something to look at. Well, oh, oh, it's not quite done. Uh, something I should point out about the computers: notice the total memory in use and the total number of total amount of free RAM. This computer has nowhere near the uh, memory capacity it needs to scan something this big. Um, the downside is, what that's going to mean is that it's going to take a lot longer. Uh, as soon as, I mean, we've only got 16 gigs of RAM on this machine, so it's using 18 gigs of RAM for this process. That means a good chunk of this has gone to, um, is using virtual memory off the hard drive, which is about 100 times slower than actual RAM RAM. So as soon as this number, and this number can just keep going up and up and up, and as long as you're patient, it's no big deal. But looks like this is going to be a situation that calls for patience. So I'm going to pause the video, and uh, we'll pick this up when this is done. All right, so we're back again. The outliers have been removed, and you notice that our surface looks a whole lot cleaner. We don't have nearly as many of those spiky edges. What spiky edges we have are few and far between. A lot of this garbage that was floating around outside also just goes away. Uh, it still is not a mesh, I wonder if one of them is. but if I come over here and I look, I can see where there's holes in it, holes in the data. So if there's a spot on the back of the skull. I need to rescan. Looks like uh, that's never that's a, that's actually where the spinal cord goes up, so that's never filling in. And where's a couple other spots? The top side of this orbital cavity. I knew it was going to be a pain. Yeah, right there, there's some stuff that I missed. So, I'm going to uh, take a step back and scan this thing a little bit more and try and fill in the glaring holes, anyway. 